what are some of the difficult times that that you have experienced in in your entrepreneurial journey? There are so many to name, but a, but a couple come to mind. I'll, I'll go back to around 2015, 2016. We're in the thick of, of building our team, building trust with that team, of trying to grow the business, of managing expectations of customers, managing expectations of investors, managing expectations of our board. And it felt as though you know, we were not performing on any of those dimensions. And so it felt like we weren't uh, meeting anybody's expectations and, and Keith and I felt stuck. I reached out to a buddy of mine who also is an, an Emory alum, Keith and I are Emory alums, who was further along in his search fund journey as a CEO and just gave him a ring and, and just wanted to kind of tease through some of his learnings. And so I remember I was close to getting home, but, but didn't quite make it in time for the call. So I parked my car um, on the side of the road next to a church and took the call um, and really just kind of dove in and shared employees aren't getting it. Um, we're not getting the response that we want from customers. Investors you know, don't really see our vision for the business. We're going back and forth and we, we haven't hit the stride uh, with our board. Um, and so we feel like, frankly, um, we're losing on all fronts. And so um, Andrew, you know, asked some thoughtful questions, um, poked and prodded, and I'll never remember or i never forget these words and a book recommendation, which is one of you know my favorite entrepreneurial books. And what he told us was, I hear you, I respect you, uh, but you guys run the company, so it's all your fault. Um, <laughs> and so we sat back stunned uh, because frankly, we felt as though, or, or kind of in the thick of, we felt as though everything was happening to us. But in saying that everything is our fault, um, he wasn't saying that we were causing all of, you know, all of the, the issues or challenges that we were facing, but we were responsible for all of them. And so that really forced Keith and I to shift our mindset from kind of woe is me to we have to take the, take the reins, take responsibility for you know, our staff and team dynamic for our, you know, our relationship with our key customers, our relationships with our investors, you know, how we engage the board. And instead of kind of waiting for things to happen, we had to control our part of those dialogues of those conversations. And it's challenging because as kind of first time executives, uh, you are learning as you go. And, and one of the book recommendations that Andrew made uh, was a hard thing about hard things, mm. um, which is written by Ben Horowitz. And in reading that book, um, it really encapsulated the entrepreneurial journey for the executive, which is, um, you know, lots of executives and CEOs uh, tend to be type A personalities, did well in school, kind of got the gold star in everything that they did. And now you're in a seat for which there is no book that you can read that fully prepares you. Um, and, and your role as an individual contributor at a consulting firm or a bank or a law firm doesn't quite mimic what it feels like where the buck stops with you and you have to come to grips with it's a journey to be an effective leader and likely you are starting out not in the top quartile of performers and you're likely starting out in the bottom quartile and making peace with the fact that I am not the best CEO or president I can be um, and I have to focus on getting better because the company can only get better if we as the leaders get better. Um, so I would say that, that that was really a challenging moment. And then another one comes to mind. Well, well, going back on that, how long did it take for you and Keith to really feel like you were making progress from that moment of realization that you were not being what you needed to be as leaders, as individuals? About how long did it take to really say, you know what, I actually feel we're making progress? I think it, it took a year and it took a year of coaching. Um, so that's something that I, I very much recommend, but especially for first time CEOs, you don't know what you don't know. It's helpful to have an objective third party um, who, who doesn't have you know a, a horse in the race uh, and really can help you identify your blind spots, where you need to work, how you show up you know, what your executive presence looks like. And I think through a year of coaching, a year of Keith and I really um, leaning on one another, um, I think that was the benefit of us knowing one another and, and us being true partners was when one of us had a bad day, 
Uh, the other one was there to lift the other up. Yeah. And so it was very rarely that both of us had bad days at the same time. So there was at least some momentum to propel us forward that, you know, hey, we're making progress, we're chopping wood, you know, we're moving incrementally. But I think kind of after we got that piece of advice in that conversation, I think 12 months post that conversation, I think that's when we really look back to say, you know, hey, we really have a handle on this business now. Yeah. We have the right perspective and the right presence as executives to have the conversations that we need to have with stakeholders. And we are moving the business forward versus being at effect to what other people want us to do to move the business forward. You and Keith have a process or a day when you just kind of took inventory of each other in terms of, hey, it's been X number of years. Let's let's take a pause and see like, what do, what do we really think that we're each best at and not best at and how do we need to reorient? As a part of our coaching, um, we did what is called a BAM, which is a build, you know, building alignment meeting. And although I've known Keith over 20 years, um, that meeting really changed our working relationship and our friendship because we went really deep and we went through a life map and explain kind of the highs and lows and what makes us who we are and why we respond in certain situations the way that we do, why our strengths lean towards certain directions and really laid bare, you know, here is who I am. Here is why I'm here. Here's how I think I can best show up and get us to the place that we want to be. And I think leaving that BAM, um, which was really raw, right? Because it was, you know, hey, you know, we're getting our teeth kicked in, you know, the business is moving along steadily, but not as quickly, not as effectively as anybody wants. It was really a good release valve, right? Because everybody wants to succeed. And if we're not succeeding in the way that we want to succeed, there's also the opportunity to have kind of pent up frustration and resentment towards the other person. And I think that BAM was really the release valve to one say, hey, you know, not only is this my business partner, but this is my brother, this is my friend, and he's human just like I'm human. And he was man enough to be vulnerable and share his story, his path um, in a way that neither of us really knew. And from that moment, I think we both kind of said, we decided to partner and do this for a reason. Um, we have complementary skill sets, we have overlapping skill sets, but our complementary skill sets are defined enough to where if both of us are focused in our respective lanes and doing what we're supposed to do, right? The collective is far more powerful than what we could accomplish individually. And I think that's where we gain the trust to not sit in every single meeting together and start to say, hey, you know, Mike is gonna focus in these areas and I trust him, I know how he's gonna make the decision we have a mechanism to talk about how we make, you know, make decisions and how we think about the world. So he can triage that area. I can triage this area. And so now we're really getting the benefits of scale versus kind of both of us, you know, kind of leading in parallel. We could really kind of mm. flank our, you know, flank the challenges in the business as well as the opportunities and just better execute. That's really cool. And that, I think that's very timely for us to be discussing because with my wife now coming into the business full time, aside from, you know, she was moonlighting basically last year, lawyer by day, COO, CFO, <laughs> post producer of video at night, a top of mom of two. Our marriage, our partnership is now taking on a different dynamic with different tests. And I think that is great to kind of have that building of alignment meeting. We, we do have like an annual marriage review, but now there's like a different context to this. And I think it's really important to do that on a more, actually a more frequent basis as opposed to annual, because we have these added pressures of now being, you know, pa partners and colleagues in day to day. And I think it, it, it is important for us to, to have that communication. Absolutely. So let's go back to that, uh, second book talked okay. about the first one being hard things about hard things by ben horowitz but what are some other books that have really kind of impacted how you look at uh, entrepreneurship or, or maybe even business in life 
Yeah. So I'm an avid reader. So I, I, if you could look in the background, I know it looks like there's a, there's a fake plastic background, <laughs> um, but, but I'm, I'm really in the attic because I kind of my books spill over. But if I had to think about books that really help me and reframe how I look at entrepreneurship and being a leader, I would definitely say uh, Traction by Gino Wickman, mm. which is uh, the book that details EOS. I think that book um, stopped Keith and I in our tracks um, and forced us to realize that solving every problem in the business, A, um, was not good from a, from a effectiveness and, and psychological and mental perspective, um, but we were never going to be able to accomplish our goals. Um, and the EOS system was simple enough for us to take and implement and see pretty immediate change. Um, but in the simplicity, it was robust enough uh, to add lots of layers of granularity, um, you know, lots of complexity. So I, I think the system of EOS and, and reading traction um, and not skipping the steps um, really transformed and redefined our business. And so what we realized um, as it relates to, to, to traction in EOS was um, we purchased a company and skipped the step of really sharing with our teammates as well as our investors and our customers really what our vision was for the company right we we bought the company and and really jumped in and started doing and asked other people to do alongside you know do alongside us without really sharing with everyone when this painting is done here's what we want it to look like and so we started from scratch and we started with the vision and the values and started using those visions and values to really drive what is an activity that our business based on this value, based on our values will and won't do, right? Who are the team members who are on the bus? And does every member of this team from a value perspective fit, right? But without those, we really were, um, to, to, to use uh, the quote of a good friend, um, really stressed out and putting out a lot of fires with our face. And I think tra you know, traction <laughs> in that EOS system gave us a framework to start looking at our business and, and what we wanted to do with it. To that end, uh, another book that's really helped is The Vision Driven Leader. The Vision Driven Leader really goes into a great level of detail to extract you know, tactic versus strategy versus vision. And truly the vision is helping people see a picture of a growing business, a thriving business, a business where they're respected, a business where people's input is taken into account. And that's not necessarily, you know, we're going to go into the Virginia market, but really giving people a sense of ownership and showing them that they have a place and that what we're all doing together is important and it matters, right? Our business is at the nexus of healthcare, right? We, we survey medical imaging equipment to make sure people who get X-ray and CT scans are, are properly diagnosed. Uh, on the other side of our business, our, our physicists work directly with oncologists to make sure that patients who have cancer are receiving the right treatment, right? So what we're doing matters and making sure, you know, what we're communicating to our team is not just the day-to-day -day tactics of, you know, we need to collect receivables faster, or we need to have, you know, 10 more sales meetings a week, but really driving the organization with a compelling vision that people can get behind and that people raise their hand and opt into. Um, I like that because it also makes me think about vision as also what it means to the individuals on that team. Absolutely. Like what is our shared vision for you, as opposed to like, our goal is to get to the million dollars by the end of this year. Cool. That makes you rich. That makes your business better. But what does that mean to me, the other person on the team, you know, having find out what their vision is even long-term. It's okay if they don't have that high definition, but just making sure that, you know, we equally care about them as individuals and, and their development. And which brings me, uh, Jordan, to, to my next book recommendation, which is Everybody Matters. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that book really highlights and drills down into what you, you just said, which is 
focusing at the individual level in terms of uh, what's in it for uh, each team member, right? So there's a lot of negative connotations as it relates to private equity and, and, and search is kind of a variant of, of the private equity model. And so what I tell people all the time, particularly with service businesses is, right, you're buying relationships and you're buying goodwill, but you, you haven't bought the hearts and minds of the people. Our staff is our business, right? We, we don't have a factory. We don't produce widgets. And when we purchased the company in 2014, right, we have to earn the right to lead. And I think what, what we realized, to your point, is um, a very narrow definition of success, uh, which only involved Keith, myself, and investors. And A, was not compelling. And B, doesn't promote the culture that attracts talent, that retains talent, and, and that produces an environment where people enjoy working. I mean, at the end of the day, to be candid, throughout this journey of entrepreneurship, we did a recapitalization with, with Blue Sea Capital in 2019. You know, we were able to provide a successful res result for our search fund investors. But the most gratifying part of the experience was being able um, to sit down uh, with each and every employee of our company, uh, be able to sit across from them, hand them a check to say thank you, but really talk through where we all were in 2014, where we are in 2019, and what the future holds for them, right? For example, we had you know, some people on our team in 2015 who we hired off of Craigslist um, to be an admin assistant. Um, and that person is our HR manager. That's right? awesome. And you read books like Everybody Matters and you know, everybody who goes to B school focuses on you know, the finance classes or you know, you know, the, the, the classes that have all these theoretical underpinnings, but nobody really focuses on the organization and management. But if you are a leader of an organization that is the most important, right? Your job is to be a steward of the people whose hopes and dreams rely on, you know, you making sure that you give them the resources to be successful and you're leading them in a direction that contributes to success. Um, and Everybody Matters um, just helped us to remember that you know, we want to create a culture where the best ideas do not always emanate between me and Keith's four ears, right? <laughs> that every single person and each person that we hire, I share with them the same nugget, which is you have selected to be a part of this team. We've selected you to be a part of this team. And with that comes uh, the responsibility and the voice to make this a better place, right? Doesn't matter if you've been here 10 minutes or 10 years, Everybody at this company has a seat at the table and your voice is just as important as anybody else's. And we, we're relying on you, particularly our new team members, to look at things in a way with fresh eyes that it's hard for us to see because we've been doing it the same way for a number of years. And you have the responsibility to raise your hand and say, hey, um, you know, there's a better way of doing this. For example, just in December, we brought a new team member on staff um, on our accounting team and a finance team. We were having this onboarding conversation, which Keith and I do for every employee, because again, the culture that we're building um, at Apex, we really want to stress that you know we don't rest on pomp and circumstance. There is no ivory tower. Um, you know our door is not closed. You know there is no executive assistant that that schedules you six months out to talk to Keith and myself. Right. We're on Microsoft Teams. We're on, you know, email just like everyone else. And as um, as a part of, of this teammates onboarding, she circled back right after I gave the speech that you now have the responsibility to see something, say something. And I want to say a week later, um, she pinged me on Teams and we chatted for 10 minutes. And she said, you know, I've been looking at the accounting software. There's a lot of stuff that we're not doing and we're paying a lot of money for this tool and we're not uh, getting the benefit from it. So you know, if it's okay with you, you know, I'm gonna speak to my manager and, and I'm gonna put together a plan on how we can better use this accounting software 
to get you guys more data so we can make better decisions in the company. And if you don't have that orientation that everyone in the organization matters, you don't have that buy-in where people don't feel like, you know, I just kind of stay in my queue, do the bare minimum uh, to kind of shuffle through, but really do feel like they have a voice in the company. That's interesting also, just because it's, it really highlights the principle and the fact that it's not just the money that matters. And, you know, I even look back on my banking days and then I were like, I got that bonus check and that would last for like a day in terms of the emotional high. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like, it's, cool. I got another five decks to do tonight. Yeah. <laughs> but you know it, as opposed to that emotional, like, like in the first, particularly first three to four years of banking out of the six years that I did, it was the emotional involvement was so intense and so high because I, I think that um, the firm I was with, BDA, just did such a good job at having a culture that was flat, particularly in our New York office. Mm -hmm. The last off, I stopped caring, not because of the firm, just because I was at a different place, my, my love affair with banking or lack thereof. Um, but I just, I think to that first three years and they just such, did such a good job of respecting everyone, feel like they're a part of it. And like this New York office and the New York side of this out of the global offices ain't going to work unless the analyst is speaking up in a meeting all the way up to the MD. Absolutely. I, I think you raised a really good point, which is it's not about money. Um, I caution people who reach out to me um, who are interested in search um, or interested in ETA more broadly, um, right? My path is search funds, but you know, I feel very strongly that, that ETA as kind of a broader category is a viable path for those who decide to go down that journey. But what I tell people, and this is the God's honest truth, is from the time that we bought the company um, until the time that we recapped the company and, and began our partnership with Blue Sea, Keith and I looked at the financial model and the potential financial rewards for he and I twice, maybe, maybe three times. Because what you realize is what you do every day, not your title, not how much money you have in the bank, not what you get to tell your peers and your colleagues and your classmates at the five-year or the 10-year reunion is really the biggest barometer of success. And so when I mentor, or when I coach, or when I advise current searchers, uh, operators, or aspiring searchers, um, I always ask them the question, um, you know, what leader or what type of leader do you want to be? Um, and what does that leader do every day? And what I mean by that is, are you energized by data and you want to have a handle on data and, and galvanize your business by executing data? Are you more of a coach mentor leader where you really want to build a team and where you want to add value is in the, your ability to coach motivate and kind of guide your team? Are you a sales CEO where you are the face of the company and, and you really are the evangelist who tells the story to uh, potential customers, potential partners, uh, potential employees? There's no one size fits all. Um, but what I will say is um, the path of ETA, you are going to likely be in the seat as an operator, you know, on average, you know, five to seven years, right? And so anything in life, um, a reward at the end of the rainbow, you know, five to seven years down the road is not going to be enough to keep you excited, to keep you motivated, um, to keep your eye on the prize. And so you have to figure out uh, from, a, from a personal growth and professional growth perspective, you know, what are your strengths? You know, what is your superpower? And what is it that you should be doing every day? And then what should you be deputizing other people in the business to do? Um, but the point around um, it not being um, in it for, you know, the money alone is not going to be a strong enough motivator. In my experience, that rings true. And, and I caution people who are looking at uh, the search path or the ETA path and kind of the only reason that they want to go down the path that's financial. I just think it's a, it's a long, hard slog. And 
if making money is is really what is your motivator or focus, um, which there's nothing wrong with, right? I, again, this is not a, a personal indictment on anyone and, and their goals and our objectives. I just think there are other ways, probably more straightforward ways over a five to seven year period to make money. But I think the path of finding yourself, finding your voice as a leader, I think that going the entrepreneurial path really is a path of personal growth and reflection, right? I was talking to um, one of our vendors who's also an entrepreneur just last week. I'm only responsible for my one piece. If something doesn't get done or it fails, right? I can always say, well, yeah, my, my spreadsheet or, or my, you know, my analysis or my presentation or my version of the code or my piece of the project was A plus is not my fault. You don't get that. You know, you, you're not granted that that level of uh, of of, uh, of of lack of kind of ownership and responsibility, right? You know, Andrew was right. It, it is all your fault, and if you can embrace that and kind of use it as um, something to propel you in terms of of motivating you and being accountable and responsible, um, and heaping the praise on your team, it's incredibly rewarding, right? There's so much that I know about myself and my purpose um, that I don't think that I could have discovered taking another path um, that may have in the near term um, built, um, you know, you know, built a, a more robust, you know, bank account. But also I think um, it, it totally depends on where you are in your career. I know Jordan, you said that there was a point where you fell out of love with banking. And, and I think when Keith and I started down this path, um, the question that we asked ourselves was, you know, is this the time to earn or is this the time to learn, right? And for us, we decided this is the time to learn. And what we wanted to learn is we wanted to learn how to, you know, research industries, analyze business models, find businesses, right? Build relationships with business owners, you know, talk to and work with investors, Um receive coaching and guidance and mentorship from people who have been there and done that. Um, you know, manage and lead teams, be responsible for the financial result, right? Those are things that we wanted to learn. Well, let's go to the, to, I think a bigger question, which is knowing what you do now, you know, what seven or eight years into this experience, would you have done search again? would you have done ETA again on a holistic perspective? And who do you think should do it? And who do you think needs to not do this? No matter how sexy it might appear in the uh, annual search fund studies and the dreams that are sold. So let's, (laughs) so is this worth it, the ETA path, knowing what you know now, who is it for? Who is it not for? Um, would I do search again? Yes. Um, I would only do search again with my partner. Um, I think that it's a very lonely journey you know, where I have blind spots. My partner you know, makes up for it in spades and vice versa. Um, I think ETA is a very viable path uh, for folks who want to be entrepreneurs but don't necessarily have the startup idea that they want to run with or really feel like their skill set lends itself to taking something and making it better. I don't think that everyone is cut out um, to be a startup founder, and I don't think everyone is cut out to be um, an ETA executive or operator. I think to the question who it's for, I think it's for someone uh, who truly wants to be an entrepreneur. I think with the proliferation of ETA, um, you know, search, self-funded search, incubators, accelerators, there's a lot of capital, there's a lot of opportunity to participate. Um, I think, and now, now I feel like the, the old guy, uh, but way back in ancient history in 2013, it was harder uh, to connect with investors, it was harder to engage, all of that information was not as readily available. And so what I find is there are some people who pursue this model who kind of view it as kind of entrepreneurship light, 
or more of a, a business school fellowship or, or risk adjusted kind of dip into the pool for entrepreneurship. I'm not sure that that's what the, the model, the ETA model was ever designed to do. Um, I still think that ETA is for that person who looks themselves in the mirror and says, I am willing to bet on myself. I'm willing to take the risk. I'm willing to sit in the hot seat. I want to create. I want to build something that I'm proud of. I don't think it's for someone who is not self-aware. Um, I don't think it's for someone who is not open to criticism or feedback. I don't think it's necessarily, I reiterate it again, I don't think it's for someone that who can't see a benefit beyond kind of the financial rewards. If there isn't, I think a personal or professional mm. learning or growth component to the path. I just don't think at the end of it, they will feel as though that that was time, you know, best spent. Um, yeah. I think that's such a huge point that I've learned now at this, you know, 13 year mark into my career is that it is not about the money. I felt that bonus check in banking, that hundred percent bonus check. It's not about the money. It is about every single day do you love what you do? And do you love the downs as much as the ups or appreciate the downs as much as the ups? It's, it's just like, people should just erase that from their minds. Like just take it out, take it off the picture. Don't even talk about the money because the incremental difference, but the marginal difference between your happiness at a hundred K or 75, or even 50. If you're at 50K and you love your every single day, Versus the person who make it a million and they have to give up everything else and they never and they actually are not happy in their day to day that they spend how many hours a day at? It's just not about the money. Well, I think the other thing that that you raise is, you know, I, I decided to go the search fund route when I finished Booth. A number of my classmates, you know, went to a number of professions, and I think, I guess, a, another thread that I would kind of pull on a little bit is. I don't think it's for the person who is interested in taking long cuts to accomplish their goals. That's something that we talked about earlier, but I think in general, you know, risk averse people um, tend to create these artificial milestones to accomplish their goals. And so I think that that won't be a good fit or ETA won't be a good fit because as you are kind of chugging along, right? And they're going to be, you know, if you went to a great business school or you worked in banking or private equity or consulting or an industry where you're doing well, right? There's going to be people in, in your immediate circle, you know, while you are running a business in search who may be making more money than you, who are likely making more money than you, right? And, and so I think one of the things that you have to come to, to peace with, and I think Char Charlie Munger, um, Warren Buffett's business partner has a great quote, which is one quote that I live by, which is um, there, there will always be someone getting richer faster than you. This is no great tragedy. And I think that is the best perspective to have. And Jordan, when you talk about happiness and what you enjoy doing every day, right? If you can't come to, you know, if you can't find that peace, that the path that you, is cho you have chosen is uniquely for you and that there are, there are psychic rewards as well as financial rewards. What I will say is it's not about the money, but I'm not anti-money either because yeah. I do think that you know, being able to have access to resource to build a successful, profitable business, depending on your point of view in the world, you know, does help you build a network, does afford your resources to be able to to share that worldview, promote that worldview, to be able to kind of put your money where your mouth is. In our in example, 2020 was a tough year for everyone. And there was so much going on, but for Keith and I kind of both being African-American, you know, the civil unrest as it relates to George Floyd and the number um, of African-Americans um, who died at the hands of the police in the United States was a very troubling and very heart-wrenching time for us. And so, you know, one of the things that, we have to you know, all recognize is no single person can change the world, but we do have to look within our sphere of control to say if something isn't right and we want to change something, 
you know, what can I do with the levers that I do have? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we have been afforded this opportunity to participate in the search fund community and ETA community. Um, and we do feel like we have a responsibility um, to give back to ensure that um, throughout the stack from aspiring searchers to searchers to operators. Um, and I think the kind of the final leg of, uh, of the marathon is, is really participating as investors and mentors. Um, we want to see um, a more diverse ETA and search fund community and being able to marry our passion and to push towards a result, right? Because, you know, I would say candidly, you know, Keith and I would not have been satisfied with our journey if we weren't able to, you know, satisfy our personal and professional goals, but also have that manifested in a result, you know, financially that we were proud of, right? So the money was, you know, was a lagging indicator of us learning and growing. It was a byproduct. It was the result, right? It wasn't the driver. It wasn't the leading indicator, you know, our ability to take that advice from Andrew to put it into play, to work with our coach, to implement EOS, to get support from our team, to build those relationships with investors and our board, all of that culminated in, in the result that we were looking for, but it was not the sole driver. And with a positive result, now we can you know, invest our dollars and our time in promoting that diverse search fund community that we want. So. You know, what does that mean specifically? Um, so what that means specifically is we are focused on um, building a network for Black searchers. Um, we are really focused on contributing and supporting um, women in search. We want to facilitate conversations with investors uh, to understand that everyone doesn't come from the same background, doesn't share the same life experiences, and so sometimes we feel as though in a quest to be colorblind as a society, that the best way to promote equality or equity is to treat everyone the same, uh, but everyone isn't the same. And so you know, making sure that we are mindful and sensitive to different people, different cultures, different backgrounds. And so we're not really abiding by the golden rule, but we're really abiding by the platinum rule which is not do unto others as we would have them do unto us, but really do unto others as they need us to do unto them so that we can best serve them to help them to get to where they want to go. So I think personally- What does that mean like specifically? So let's dive in even deeper. Like sure. for, you say you want to have an impact on getting African-Americans, women into the search community top down from people wanting or exploring to people in the search, to the operators, to even the LPs. But what is that like? specifically mean so for example you know mike and keith are going to spend one hour each week to do those calls or to do x number of panels or to be an lp and don't and, and do this amount of units that we'll invest in like what did you guys have specific goals so so i think the answer is all of the above and i think the the other um optimistic and and really hopeful finding is there are uh, black searchers. There are women searchers and there are networks that are beginning to form. So I want to be really clear that um, this is not something that Keith and I um, can or want to tackle alone. Um, we really do live by a motto, um, you know, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So there has, uh, there's, there, there are communities and networks, actual codified communities being formed by virtue of the Black Searcher net Network women in search. Um, Keith and I specifically are working with individuals um, in the Black Search Network to, um, to, to, to focus on being on panels, to focus on um, reaching out to professional networks that we are members of or, or we know of or have access to, to make sure that the opportunity is more readily available and access to, to information and, and LPs who invest are making time. Um, we're also kind of uh, voting with our own time and our own dollars. So we are focused on carving out time in our weeks and months um, to do office hours with uh, aspiring searchers, with current searchers, with operators. Um, and we are um, you know, focused on, and, and we began to do some of this uh, towards the tail end of 2020, um, and we'll continue to do so in 2021, is um, participate in search more broadly, but make sure that 
Um, our mandate also includes ensuring that um, we do, um, you know, we, we kind of eat our own cooking and we are backing and supporting diverse researchers. Um, but there's more work to do. And, and what, what gives me hope is, um, you know, our, you know, again, kind of going back to something that we talked about in terms of it not just being for the money, um, one of the things that Keith and I wanted to do was we wanted to go through this journey to grow, but we also did want to learn from investors and build relationships with those investors so that when it came time like today to do things that matter to us the most, uh, we do have the ear of other members of the community. And what I will tell you is um, there are a number of investors that uh, participated in Seneca Creek, which is our search fund, and, and didn't participate or you know, formed after Seneca Creek. So I think that there is um, momentum and appetite to do so. Um, but you have to, again, it's, it's the slow grind work, right? It's not for the money and it's not the great, we did a press release, but it is the, you know, what are we going to commit to doing? What are we going to commit to investing in terms of time and dollars so that in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, right? You know, ETA continues to grow. Um, it attracts, you know, who it needs to attract kind of, you know, based on folks who really do want to pursue this path of entrepreneurship through acquisition. And people feel like that there are people who look like them and come from um, communities like them and have had shared experiences. Um, they see themselves in the community um, at, at, at each phase of the process. So speaking of the grind, that kind of reminds me of the other entrepreneurial stories out there or that you have had. Uh, I forget the exact details. All I remember is the word Safeway. Ah, <laughs> so. <laughs> Tell me about Safeway. So Safeway um, is the grocery store um, within walking distance of my former place in Baltimore. And um, I remember this story um, on Thursdays in September, um, there are musicians and the like um, who perform in a park just up the road from my former place. And so what that means is we live in the city and so street parking is very hard to come by. And so this was just after um, a particularly challenging board meeting, um, you know, a customer meeting that did not go the right direction and uh, you know, us rowing the oars of EOS without the full buy-in of the team. And so I circled my block around about 12 times. I couldn't find a place to park. I was getting home from work at around eight o'clock. Um, this was a point where you know, we were, Keith and I were not firing on all cylinders. So this is that path in between, right, it's your fault and we have a grasp on the business. Um, and I found myself um, getting really tired and frustrating, frustrated and I parked my car uh, in a Safeway parking lot. Um, and um, I did the only thing I knew to do, which is I called my mom and I just began weeping. Um, and, you know, I told her, I'm not sure that I'm doing the right thing and I'm not sure that I'm good at this and I'm not sure um, that I'm leading in the right way. And um, my mom consoled me and encouraged me um, in a way that only a mom can. Um, but I share that story because oftentimes, you know, when we, you know, watch stories on YouTube or on LinkedIn or we go to panels, um, and, and we look at what we perceive as success on the outside, um, you know, folks kind of tell the abridged version of their story, which is, you know, we found a great company, bought it, it was growing like a weed, we hired some awesome people, and like it was up to the right, you know, it was top gun high fives every day. And I share that story because that was not my experience. That was not Keith's experience. And so I say it because um, it is always a reminder and a, and a gut check, you know, now that we've been CEOs and, and presidents for seven to eight years 
and you know people kind of look at wow you know look at what the company was when you guys purchased it and what it's doing today um, and it's just that reminder you know to never read your own press or drink your own kool-aid too much um, and it's also to share with people that you know this is doable for the person who really wants to do this and it aligns with their personal and professional goals um, it is not out of reach and that um, in sharing the vulnerability that success is rarely this up and to the right story um, to also prepare people for what to expect. I think sometimes um, in the community of search or in the community of ETA more broadly, by only highlighting these swimming successes where everything went right, um, we don't fully prepare people for the emotional journey that they're going to go down. And so Safeway is, is just a, a very humbling reminder that the path from 2014 to 2021 was not up and to the right. And that there were plenty of times where there was self-doubt. Um, there are plenty of times where the feedback was not positive. Um, there were plenty of times where um, you wanna quit, you wanna kind of hand over the keys. Um, but you know, if you're working with the right people, if you're focused on the right things and headed into the directions and doing something that's aligned with your values, um, success can be at the end of the rainbow. And, and again, it's not about the money, but um, it really is about the journey. And, you know, the journey is not all, all going to be, um, you know, ice cream with sprinkles. And so yeah. that's actually one of the reasons <laughs> that we, we, we called our search fund Seneca Creek Partners, because in a former life, in my first entrepreneurial venture, um, where I ran a custom clothing business um, that we had to shutter in 08, 09, um, what I realized was uh, my uh, emotional state was directly tied to the fortunes of the business um, and that it, it wasn't healthy. And so um, at the time we formed Seneca Creek, uh, Keith and I both started to dive into stoicism, um, kind of the Greek philosophy of, of stoicism and really focusing on equanimity. So Seneca, kind of the, the, stoic, the stoic philosopher is, is kind of where we got that. And, and throughout this entire journey, um, Keith and I would always remind ourselves of this very simple phrase, which is not too high, not too low right? You know, you have to find a way to take what life is going to give you, right? And find a way to modulate it in a way such that the extremes are not so high and so low that you feel like you're constantly being whiplashed. And so for us, it was just that simple phrase where if we had a particularly great event, right? We closed, you know, a, a six-figure client or you know, we were able to, you know, hire our first choice, you know, physicist. These are all positives, you know, or we had a particularly bad experience where we lost a key account or uh, we weren't able to hit our quarterly objectives. Um, not too high, not too low. I love that. It, you know, that those stories really remind me about the journey I've been on. And when I realized that I wasn't a entrepreneur and I wasn't actually an entrepreneur and those realizations only came actually through the downs when I realized as I was coming out that I still wanted to do it as opposed to the highs and the success. And then I said, that's why I'm an entrepreneur because I can do a you know seventy five thousand dollars sale. Oh, now I'm a real entrepreneur. Like screw you, corporate world. No, like I realized when I got off the floor crying in a cafe in Hoboken that I still wanted to do it. I still need to support my family, and it was the that was like the bottom of the entrepreneurial experience. And I've had multiple lows like that, but each one made me realize that this is the path that I am meant to do in my life. And it actually just cemented that identity and that I was no longer this somewhat of like a charlatan in this entrepreneurial world 
and I had CEO in the title. Like that meant nothing. It meant nothing. <laughs> There's it. You raise a very interesting point. Um, this entrepreneur versus entrepreneur. Um, and, and, and what it reminds me of is, I think the makings of an entrepreneur are, are, are what, um, what that person is made of in the dark. It's not in the yeah. light, right? It's very easy um, to get business cards and put up a website and tell people all the amazing things that you're going to do. Um, I think that's the easy part of entrepreneurship. Um, I think the hard part of entrepreneurship is um, facing your fears, you know, facing your failures, um, coming out of those failures, um, addressing those fears. What if this doesn't work? How am I going to feed my family? Um, I think that's, those situations are what expose an entrepreneur to him or herself. Um, I, I personally believe that, um, there's kind of been this deification of entrepreneurship where um, you know, everybody should be an entrepreneur. Um, I'm not sure that that's the case. I think everyone should contribute and find something um, that they value um, and you know, work with people whom they trust, like, and respect. Um, but I, I'm not sure the entrepreneurial journey is for everyone. And I think um, a question that, that, that aspiring entrepreneurs um, might want to ask themselves is, would I still pursue this if no one knew, right? If there, if, there, if there were never going to be a podcast or an Inc. Magazine write-up or your profile on LinkedIn where everybody kind of looks up to you as a CEO, you know, would the activity of taking an idea or taking a business and putting your fingerprints on it and making it better or taking an idea from a piece of paper and manifesting it, would that be enough in and of itself, right? If there were no applause, um, if there were no, um, you know, fanboys and girls kind of clapping and applauding every step, would, would doing the work be enough? And if you can answer, doing the work would be enough, then I think you're ready for entrepreneurship. And, and the last thing that I will say is um, everyone wants to try to find the better mousetrap of taking entrepreneurial risk without taking entrepreneurial risk. Um, but it's, try, it's, it's like being halfway pregnant. And so I talk to people all the time um, particularly my really smart friends who want to outsmart the emotional process of managing risk and managing fear. And so what I tell them is you can read all the blogs, you can read all the books, um, you can join all of the groups, um, but until you decide in your mind and in your heart that there is something that you're called to do, um, and that doesn't mean just throw caution to the wind, because I do think that there's um, entrepreneurs, you know, at their core are finding ways to mitigate their risk so that the business survives and that you're finding that right, you know, product market fit to thrive. So I think this myth that, that entrepreneurs are just kind of throwing spaghetti at the wall, I think that you can be a very wise and prudent entrepreneur managing risk so that your business succeeds. But in terms of taking that leap, right, the analogy I give people is, um, and, and this one really hits home because uh, up until I think it was 10, I was, I was deathly afraid of swimming. Um, now I love to swim. Um, but the analogy I give people is um, until you resolve in your mind and your spirit um, that this is something that you're called to do um, and, and you're ready to deal with um, the emotional and psychological aspect of the journey, because that's the biggest piece is the, your emotions and your psychology Right. Until you're ready to 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 confront those and kind of take whatever step is meaningful to you, you are holding on to the side of the pool and you're flapping your arms and you're kicking your legs, but you're not swimming. Yeah. Yeah. So that's brilliant. <laughs> right. You can. And that brings up a fantastic point that you can mitigate business risk. Yes. You will not escape the emotional risk. 
it no. will happen. Yes. The difference between year one version of us versus year five version of us is not that we don't feel it. It's just that we know how to handle it better. Absolutely. And Absolutely. actually now I, I am so much more objective or even stoic about it. And it's like, okay, I'm feeling that. Like we just lost a big bitch that we worked really hard for. Okay, that's fine. Move on to the next one. You know, just almost, and it's not in a, in a negative way. It's more an objective detachment from the downs because you're not going to, you can't, you cannot escape it. But by definition of doing something entrepreneurial, you are doing something risky. Yes. And, um, but I, I, I would also highly recommend, um, it's on YouTube. And, you know, before I knew better, um, when we were learning about search funds, um, I, I didn't know how influential Irv Grosbeck was to the search mm -hmm. community. And, and he's a pillar um, and someone who I had the honor and privilege of speaking with prior to doing my search. And he has uh, a video on YouTube, um, which I watch uh, every year um, around this topic of the risks of entrepreneurship. And um, he may still be, but I know that when the, the video was recorded, he was an, a professor of entrepreneurship at Stanford. And his class was one of the most popular classes in the school. And what he knew was he looked at the data as long as he was at Stanford and he knew that if he had a class of 60 people, only a handful of them were going to do anything entrepreneurially. And so he kind of took it upon himself to share his perspective on entrepreneurship right as these, these Stanford MBAs were going out into the world. And one of the things that he really said that really hit home is that there is a risk to entrepreneurship, but there is also a risk to not pursue entrepreneurship. And I think what people have to make peace with is um, a life devoid of any risk, right? You have to look back on your life, right? My, my, my boss at Morgan Stanley said, this isn't the dress rehearsal, this is the show. Um, you know, no one is saying, you know, sell all your possessions, you know, bet it all on black. But you're going to have to take some emotional and psychological risk in this life. Otherwise, you can control the result. It just may not be, you know, when you look back on the in the twilight of your life, the life that you want it for yourself. So yes, by, by not taking risk, you, you can manage certain variables and you can be in control. Um, but you're also giving up. Um, learning, you're, give, you're giving up opportunities to grow, you're giving up all of the relationships that you can only gain by bumping up against the world. There's so many, right? For example, if I had not gone down this journey, you and I would have never met. I would still be in an investment bank or a private equity firm or whatever it is that I was doing, but that's the part of the journey I think people can't see. Um, and part of it is, it is a leap of faith, right? You can mitigate business risk. Um, you are going to have to face your emotional and psychological risk, um, but you cannot predict each step of the journey, which is why I think you have to approach it with a, a level of curiosity and equanimity because uh, there are going to be squiggles along your path to success. And I do think that you know, if you find the right business, you find the right opportunity, um, you build the right team, um, I think you can, you know, manage towards success with, without, you know, taking, you know, taking, you know, without taking thoughtless risk, right? There's, 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 there's risk adjusted decisions, there's thoughtful risk, there's calculated risk, then there's thoughtless risk. I do think you can accomplish those things, but there's no way to predict the story. That's just not how life works. <laughs> well, speaking about life, I have a little 13 month old life that's crawling around the chair and my wife just gave me a look like I've been watching these kids for too long on a Saturday. So it's your turn, husband. So now she's, yeah, she's gone. 
<laughs> so we have covered a lot of ground and this has gone in some super deep directions, man. This is absolutely awesome. Yeah. And I, I hope people listen carefully to this and really take this chance to reflect on where they're at in life. And I think you just, I love this topic of entrepreneurship and risk. And um, I, I really hope people use this content as a way to step forward into the unknown because that's where I think people will find the most happiness and fulfillment. Man, it is awesome to do this and looking forward to, to doing a part two. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Jordan. Really appreciate it. All right. Talk to you later. Take care. See ya.